What's up, everyone? Thank you for joining me today on the show. I am your host for today, uh, Mike Barnes. No Robin Strand today, um, just just for today. Um, but I want to thank everyone for coming and listening. Today, I have a very special guest with me today, good friend of mine, strength and conditioning coach, powerlifter um, from here in uh, Ontario, from Windsor, a chiropractor. He is a founder of Prescript. Um, Prescript is a, uh, I guess, an organization and courses. They offer courses, barbell courses on the fundamental of resistance training, principles of movement, anatomy, biomechanics, um, injury risk management. Um, just kind of challenges you to think a little bit outside of the box when approaching training and how to differentiate yourself, differentiate yourself, and 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 use a more thoughtful, um, cerebral approach to training. Um, I've learned so much from this man. I've trained with him. Much, much, much respect for him. And I'm really glad to have him on the show and uh, let you guys kind of hear what he has to say. So I introduce to you Jordan Shaw. Stuff. Does it feel like, like, how does it feel to finally just be like, ah, this is like mine now? Uh, It still feels just like a, I hasn't set in yet. I guess would be the short answer. Like, this just feels like an, like, I still, I haven't put anything in, in like closets or drawers because yeah. it's a habit of like, well, I'm never anywhere for long. Like this is just an Airbnb <laughs> that I've. So you're just not for. settling. No. Well, cause I, and I fly out to North Carolina tomorrow. Okay. So I've literally had, like, I've had been in this place for like maybe a week. Cool. What, like what's kind of, what was happening in North Carolina courses or. No, uh, I work with a player on the Carolina Panthers. Oh, sick. Uh, so flying into Charlotte, it's like what week seven, so like halfway ish through the season. Right. Um, so yeah, I'll just get some work in with him for a week. Uh, they're coming off a Sunday game and they'll play again Thursday, so I'll be there from Monday to Saturday, yeah. and I'll just kind of like kind of be on call and whenever you know he's not with the team and that, like we'll just get some manual work in and then uh, get some work done in the gym, just kind of try to tighten things up for the second yeah. half of the season and. Yeah. You you have the coolest the coolest <laughs> clients, man. Just the coolest clients. How did it how did it how did you get here? Like just give me the background story. Just let our listeners kind of know like what's Jordan's background story? Because I think like everybody knows like Jordan Shallow now, the doctor, although you're gonna say you're not doctor, power lifter, just cool ass, badass, mofo. Um, you know, like kind of like what's the what's the background story? Yeah, so I mean, how far back do you want to go? I guess I uh, I grew uh, up in well, Windsor. Yeah, well, where did it where did it start? Where did the um, like how did you get into training, and then how did it how did you get to here from that? Um, yeah, so I, I grew up in Windsor, Ontario, for like most of my life, um, and then you know, academically, I I was more inclined to like classics and history and arts and political science, and kind of sort of started down that route, but. Fell in train, fell in love with training at like a, I don't know, pretty young age, I suppose, maybe like kind of usual, 15, 16 years old, mm-hmm. uh, and then it's training just sort of started to permeate its way like into like the forefront of my conscious thought, where it was just something I did after class, it was something I did for sport, and then all of a sudden like I like doing, I like training more than I like playing hockey, and I like training more than I like going to school, and I like training more than I like to go out. So then it's just like, okay, how can I do this and make money? Cause I'm not going to be that guy, like, you know, the, the king of Venice, like living out of his fucking van, you know, like, well, if I can out bench him and I can out squat him, it's like, oh, fuck, like, I don't want to be that fucking guy. That guy uh, is awesome. Dude. And it's like, there's, there's that, he's the essence, he's the concentrated essence of what drives all of us. But yeah. then there's the, the other parts that are like, but you live in a van. Like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, I do want to have, I do want to be able to take a shower. You know, oh, that's right. not, that's not things. A, it's a cool thing to do. Uh, um, yeah. So, so then I, um, I just started to switch careers path two ways, two years through undergrad. And I went from history, political science major to uh, kinesiology. And then with the idea of going to chiropractic college. And, you know, I, I think one of the, like the impetus for me was like, I read a Charles Poliquin article, I think when I was like, I don't know, 17, 18. And that kind of began to like, get the ball rolling of like, okay, like I can kind of, I, there's a place in the fitness industry outside of just protein powder and like Photoshop. Like there's a place to be smart. Um, and there's like a coefficient to be had. Like Paul was Jack, he had 20 inch arms. 
I was like, there's a coefficient to be had where it's like, you don't have to be Mr. Olympia, but if you can be big and like to train yourself and also understand kind of like, you know, the ins and outs of, of execution and programming and biomechanics and all that stuff, like you can kind of, there's an ascension to be had. And then, you know, people like Kelly Starrett would probably be someone who like uh, led the charge on the clinical side, you know, someone like a, like a John Meadows early in the day mm-hmm. was kind of like really bringing like a, just a deeper thought, obviously B pack, right. Like bringing yeah. this like deeper thought process. So I was like, okay, like I'm not going to be big as big as John or as, uh, or as big as Ben, but maybe I could fill in the gaps with like going really deep down, like the academic rabbit hole. Mm-hmm. Um, so I ended up in chiropractic college and then, it was just kind of steamrolled from there. Like moved to California, had a ton of opportunities just to like be in this, be in the same room, um, you know, with some pretty influential people kind of in the fitness industry. And um, yeah, just trying to like capitalize on, on some of those opportunities while still kind of maintaining like, look, I just want to train. Uh, I think that's probably been the biggest thing is like my only agenda in whatever room I'm in, regardless of any ulterior motives is like, I just want to work out. Like that's, yeah. that's like my whole thing is if, if I'm going to be with some, like a potential client or potential patient or whatever, it's like, about, I only do business meetings in the gym. Yeah. All the business meetings I do, I don't have sleeves on. And the only thing I'm focused on if I'm working with someone, you know, a potential client or whatever is just like, look, if we're here, I'll tell you everything you need to know about me in one set or less. Yeah. And then that's kind of it. Then it's just, you know, it's, it's steamrolled. California obviously has its benefits of like being around uh, a certain type of person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's just a high concentration of that. And then just, you know, I don't know, man. Like I just kind of, I don't want to say I, I hate the word sacrifice. Cause like, what, what, like, what did I sacrifice? It's like I got to be the coolest shit in the world with like the coolest people. But um, yeah, I think it was just more or less like, you know, being able to live with less for a really long time and like not really like, you know, opting, opting out was probably like one of the biggest things living in California. Like, you know, money gets tight when it's that expensive living in San Francisco. And I was just like, yeah, I, whatever. Like I'll sleep in my car if I have to, if it means in a couple of years that like this stuff pays off. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that's kind of the Coles nose version of it. Yeah. Kind of came from Windsor and just started lifting weights and didn't stop and started talking and didn't shut up and here I am. Nice. Where so where was the where were you where would you what would you say was the kind of the breakthrough moment? Where, was there a moment where you're like, oh shit, I think I made it? <laughs> Dude, I, I don't know if I'm I don't know if I'm there yet. <laughs> but it's like yeah. you know how it is, man. I don't think you're ever there. Yeah. Uh, and I think the one thing I've learned is nothing's ever as good as you think it's gonna be and nothing's ever as bad as it is. Right? Yeah, like you, you think it's always gonna it's gonna be that, that one person that one break and it's just like you know you get all excited and then it's kind of like oh okay yeah yeah it's just another step along the way and then something bad will happen and you're like oh fuck like this is gonna this is gonna like totally derail everything but mm-hmm. it's not really that um so that was kind of been like the biggest thing for me is uh, i mean i could like i think it's worth giving credit to the people who have like afforded me opportunities like I would say the most influential, uh, like the Mind Pump podcast, like hooking up with those guys early on in, in my career was really big. Mm-hmm. Yeah, being able to work with Dan Green uh, at a Boss Barbell Club like gave me a level of validity that, that I, I don't know at the time I deserved. Um, <laughs> but it was that was really cool. Uh, working at Apple was uh, a big resume builder in the Silicon Valley. Working at Stanford was uh, a big resume builder in the Silicon Valley, and and just just kind of in general carrying out and strength and conditioning doing stuff with Ben was, I I would say if I had to rank order, just like the overall impact Now doing stuff with Ben wouldn't have happened without the other things um, sort of transpiring. Um, But I think that really like doing doing seminars around the world with, with Ben was, and it's still something where I look at my phone and he texts me and I just think like, what? Like, Oh my God. Right. It's just if like, I sometimes I think to myself, like, did I just change my mom's like, not like number to Ben Pakulski? And then like, <laughs> every time mom texts me about now. So I would say those are the big ones. And I know I'm missing a bunch. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, like, I don't know if there was one real, like, catalyzing moment or catalyzing opportunity. It's just mm-hmm. sort of like a summation of like a bunch of, I don't want to say little by any stretch because every one of those, I was just like, holy fuck, like, what am I doing here? Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, it's just, it just one leads into the other and then it just compounds and snowballs, I think. I want to get into like functioning and training and that sort of thing with you. But I think just for some of the people listening, um, a lot of, you know, our listeners are probably trainers themselves and whatnot and are looking to, to kind of see the excess success that you had. Um, is there any suggestions or anything that you would say was kind of, <sighs> was there anything that you did that you would say like, this is kind of what allowed me to kind of get these breaks? Like what the, what was the first, was, was meeting Ben and hanging out with Ben the first thing that happened? And then if so, like, how did that happen? Were you just kind of training one day, you kind of see, see him and you get talking, like, how does, like, what, <clears throat> what would you say was the thing that you, that you did that kind of helped your career the most? I, I, mean, I think it's taking the time for people like and as an overarch, cause that's how like, and, and even uh, I see a lot of people who like get, and I don't know how you stratify this. It just is how my brain works. Like I see friends of mine who are like in the industry who are like orders of magnitude, like crazy successful. And they get to a point where they, they lose time for people. Mm-hmm. And I think that's like the biggest, and that, that'll, that'll be where your train stops. When you get to a point where you don't have time to like actually just, you know, kick it with someone that's yeah. when like, and some people do it like out of like a, an inclusivity and like a reclusivity where they just like, like, Oh, like, you know, Oh, I'm so, you know, uh, people come up to me in the gym and all this. And like, I just want to be alone. It's like, all right, then, then you're done. Then mm-hmm. this is whatever, whatever your, whatever tax bracket you're in on the year you decide that, then, then that's where, that's where you're going to be forever. So for me, it was just like, it's just always been kind of like people first, like take the time to, you know, like if I gotta, if, if I gotta drive two hours to go like, like you, the other day, like you came out to hang and you drove for like yeah. two hours and that yeah. meant, like, cause that's something that like, that means a lot to me that yeah. you would take the time. And when I'm put in the op- like when I have the opportunity and if I had when I had the opportunity to do that, I would say that's the biggest thing. Like early on, I, I trained with a guy named Craig Caperso and he liked to train at a certain time. And, but I like training with him. Like he was a pro bodybuilder. Like he was mm-hmm. smart. Like he had supplement deals and all this stuff and kind of gave me the ropes to the industry. And, but I wasn't going to be like, Oh no, sorry, man. I can't make it at 6 PM. How's yeah. how five thirty? Like, yeah. You just fucking make it happen. Yeah. Exactly. Right? And like, yeah, hey, do you want to go out to dinner? And it's like, you know how many times I, I rarely want to go out to dinner. Yeah. I rarely do, but I go every <laughs> single time. And every yeah. time when I'm done, I'm glad I went. Right. Yeah. I think people just, so I would say like with the Ben thing, that was like, I could, I could trace the Ben thing back and I could tell you the, the impetus of it. And it was like, it was training with Craig. So I saw this, like uh, this dude was training. He was really big. Uh, everyone kind of knew who he was. He was working with bodybuilding.com. And he had sponsorship with Cellucor. And he just happened to be training at the gym where I worked out at when I was in Cairo school. And Everyone was like, "Oh, like, can I take a picture with you and all this?" I was like, I just, "I was like, hey man, that your last set? Like, kind of like flexing on, like, get the fuck out of here. This is my gym. I don't care who you are." Yeah. And so they became friends with him, and then I got to talking, and then you know he had a website, and he had to write weekly articles, and he just didn't like doing it. So I was like, "Look, I'll do it for free." So my last year of chiropractic college, I was writing a weekly article and posting it up on his website, and he was sending it out to his email list. And he's like, "Oh man, like, you know, a friend of mine, I want you to meet. Um, we just started this podcast." Not many people know this, but Craig was the, one of the first founding members of the Mind Pump podcast. And then I had went out to dinner with him and Adam Schaefer. And obviously, if you follow fitness podcasting, Mind Pump is you know, probably one of the most, if not the most downloaded podcast in the fitness space. So I had lunch with Adam and then we connected. And then over time, I started doing stuff for them. And then I went out to Tampa for um, a business trip with my partner, my business partner. And then Adam was like, oh, you should go up to, you should go get a podcast with Ben. Yeah. Like, Holy shit. Like that's fucking, you know, you're, you're a meathead <laughs> in the Southwest Ontario. Like Ben's the dude. Um, and then that, so Adam connected me with Ben and then I, I recorded the muscle intelligence podcast with him and we trained and, you know, we got along really well and he said, come back. So it's just, it's just little things like that. Like, you know, if, if eight years before that or seven years before that, you know, I didn't like take the time to like work with Craig and write, you know, articles every week and then get an intro to Adam and then do like, you know, free content on the mind pump site and go on their podcast. And then like, none of that would have happened. So I think if, if people just like take the time to just sort of take the time, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like, you no, never know. Sense. 
Because the hard part is when people don't, they don't realize the opportunities they don't get afforded to them. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I appreciate you making that time for even just to be on this podcast. We, I, I know that you, you know, you've got a lot going on. So again, just before, before we get to the end or anything, I just wanted to say I, I do appreciate it. Um, so go just going moving forward a little bit. Like you, you, you have a with all this knowledge and all this experience that you have and all this shit going on. Um, you still find trying to train. How do you? How do you balance that, man? How do you? Like you're you're all over the world all the time. You're in and out of Airbnb, Airbnbs. Like how did how do you make that time for yourself? I mean, I know it's something I struggle with. A lot of it just systems, man. Like you know, I've I've been lucky enough, and through the advice of much smarter people than I, like uh, it was actually Ben who pushed my hand in like getting an assistant, and having someone that you trust to like really kind of manage your time because I feel like people know and want to intuitively to like, you know, be around people and all that. But, you know, there are some bottlenecks where you can only do so much in a day. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, feel like, Oh, sorry, I can't make it. Like I can't make it to me is like a really hard thing to say. Cause I know that could be leaving a potential opportunity on the table. Um, so, you know, we waste a lot of time. Like, I don't care who you are. Like we waste a lot of time and, yeah. and even my, like myself included, like I know there are things on a day to day that I'm conscious of that I'm trying to clean up and be more efficient. In. So if I ever find myself needing to say, sorry, I can't make it. Like I take a look at everything in that day and go like, well, what was I doing today where I can't make it? Or was I, did I wake up and scroll the gram for 45 minutes? Did I like, you probably fucking did. You like I still did. fucking did. Right? It's like, <laughs> and now all of a sudden I'm having like, you know, faceless interactions, you know, just <clears throat> dopamine, serotonin dumps, like oh, I'm laying on my back for you. I was like, what the fuck are you doing, man? Like, just get your ass up, do the things you have to do so you can take that 45 minutes and, and meet with someone else. Uh, so I think that's kind of been the biggest thing is just like, you know, scheduling is huge for me. Mm-hmm. Like if it's not in my schedule, like it doesn't really exist. And I'm just having help. Like I know what I'm good at <laughs> and I know what I'm not good at. And you know, that I can think back to a time where, you know, I, I was busy and not productive. So I think just doing the due diligence and having the awareness to be like, all right, look, like these are your strengths. These are your weaknesses, you know, delegate, defer, don't do it or do it right now. Like those are yeah. kind of like the, you know, those four things of decision-making. So once I did that, then it, things really started to, I think, open up because you started to be able to maximize the time you had. Like, it's literally, for me, like my, uh, and I, the assistant is such a weird word because, like, she's, she is my, con- like, confidant. She's my, like, I just, <laughs> a lot of times if I'm having a bad week, and it sounds so dramatic, but, like, I, there will be weeks where I don't talk to anyone but Renee. Really? Like, it's because, I don't know, man. Like, it's just, and maybe it's just me. Like, sometimes it just, if something comes in, I would, Hey, look, I'm like, you know, I just moved into a new place and I'm flying out tomorrow and I still want to train and all this stuff. She's just my shield to the outside world. Yeah. Like she, and she just siphons it into the thing. And sometimes when she calls me, she just puts her dog in front of face and she just talks to me while I look at her dog's face. And then she's just like, this is what you have to do right now. This is what you need to do like next week. And yeah. So like, you know, having someone like that, who's like just so, and that's like a, the her that's her skill set is organization and like managing me and stuff which has uh, been a huge catalyst and i think a lot of people could benefit from someone like that mm-hmm. but they and like i'm still like when i i cringe at my it's weird yeah but when i see see i'm not because it's but like i think of it like look cl- like clearly i need help yeah like anyone who's around me for more than five minutes goes like i hope this guy has like a helper like, yeah i i know i have for sure <laughs> right but it's like i don't know how i would get dressed most mornings if it wasn't for you know like having everything else taken care of like it just frees up so i think some people like most people who are trying to operate the fitness space like would benefit because not even that just accountability Mm -hmm. just stuff i don't want to do that i know i should do that when she tells me to do it i just go okay i just shut up like i'll do it because she told me to i wouldn't do it if i told myself to do it yeah right so are you Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt yeah. you there. No, it's just it's just a weird thing. Like I struggle with it every time I CC an email. I'm like, this is Renee. She'll take care of it because it's like it's the only way it'll get taken care of. Because if it's me, it's not going to get done. Yeah. Or do you find that you're paralyzed by that though? Like just being somebody, 
kind of giving you like, you know, you, you, you only have an hour here. You, you, you only have two hours here. Um, and then you, you've got to dip, you've got to be on to whatever else that you have scheduled, even like your training. Do you find like between, okay, I know I only have an hour and a half to train. And again, with your, your extensive knowledge, knowing how your training should go, do you find that you're paralyzed between time and your training? Mm. No, not really, man. I think it like, it would almost be the opposite. Like it kind of gives you a certain amount of freedom. Like I think like it, because I only have that time, it makes me want to value that time. Like if I'm doing something like by and large, I try to just be doing that thing. Right. And, and it's tough, man. Like, and I get trapped sometimes on days, like on days where I don't have time constraints, that's when I'm usually like on my phone between sets. Right. But on days, mm. like I went in the other day and I had to, I had to teach at six. I got out to the gym, which is like, I don't know, traffic maybe 10, 15 minutes from my house at like five 30. So I maybe had 45 minutes to an hour. And it was like the best workout I had all week. Cause it was headphones in like, you cool. know, the don't talk to me face on <laughs> and do and it was, I, it was great. I did like, I did, I, I PR like dumbbell overhead press. I, and I was a dog tired coming in, but it's like, this is the only time you have. Yeah. This is it. Right. Where sometimes it's like, I, ah, you know, go in, like I went in last night with a, with a buddy of mine and like, we kind of had open ended. We were some food after and I'd seen him in a while. And, which is great. And I think sometimes that's, that's part of training, right? That's for me anyways, like, you know, I'm not trying to be on the Olympia stage. And like when it was my set, like I was just doing that. But at the same time, it was like the idea of the workout was just to catch up, right? So on days where I'm stricter in my schedule, it allows me to be like more creative. Um, yeah. it, and it just forces you to be pr present, right? Like, I think if I, if I don't have anything, I can kind of end up doing nothing. It just sort of like, oh, I'm going to do like, I'll write some stuff here. And then I'm like, oh, like I'm going to maybe clean the stove top over here. And it's like, fuck <laughs> you doing that. Like, just, just get your shit together. <laughs> so we we you're working right now a lot at pure muscle right now is that that's kind of where your home base is or home office right now yeah so pure muscle like right now like from a clinical perspective i mean all my stuff is really online right so mm -hmm. all like i kind of i try to take care of like you know the the guys that take care of me like the guys and girls that take care of me so like from a clinical perspective like i'll work uh with with uh, Rachel and Dorian and then uh, Antoine's prepping for the Olympia uh, like working with Frank and uh, you know Cody uh, Cody Amy is like the manager so I get cans on like maybe a couple hours a week uh, and then yeah pure muscles just kind of like where I'm going to train and then you know with everything it's that moves online it's where most of if not all like the content you know, content yeah. gets filmed um, and I'm in my kitchen right now. My home office is still waiting for Amazon to uh, drop some stuff. off the contents off. But uh, yeah, that'll that'll be you know, home base. Once I get back from this trip to the States, the yeah. pure muscle will be like the, the home base. I literally got the condo I got because it's 10 minutes down the road from pure. So you're being, you're around bodybuilders a lot more than a lot more how, do, how does that how does that feel i think you know where i'm gonna go with this um this is in terms of like you with your knowledge and 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 again being around bodybuilders and kind of seeing how they train and where the dysfunctions are and where the opportunities are how how is that for you just just being around that stuff because i know like just even me just you know I walk into a gym and it just hurts my head to see certain things happen. Um, like, do you, do you still get that same type of experience being in like a gym? Like that? I've, I've become more inquisitive because mm -hmm. it's like you get to a certain point and especially, especially now it's like, I know a ton, I know a ton of people with doctor before their name, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's PhDs, whether it's chiropractors, whether it's MDs or whatever, I know way more doctors than I know people that will compete at the Mr. Olympia this year. Mm -hmm. So like, there's something to be learned, like, you know, to see, you know, like, you know, Regan and Antoine, like are both going to go to the O this year. And it's like, there, there's, there becomes a point where I need to shut the fuck up. Yeah. I just, you just need to shut the fuck up. Like, yeah. it's like, dude, what are you, what are you, what are you doing here? Like, 
this it's like the people who try and say that Usain Bolt's running technique is wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. This guy ran a 19, 19, 200 meters. Like you're wrong, bitch. Like you, it takes me like, I don't know, a minute and a half, maybe two minutes to run 200 <laughs> meters. Yeah. It's like what am I, and I think, and that's where like over time you just kind of understand that like there's, there's so many roads that lead to Rome and it's, it's, but with that being said, like, if you can get the buy-in to make minor tweaks of someone who performs that well, then you can start to see drastic differences. So it's, it's not understanding like how to pick your battles in a situation like that, because they have no reason to change what they're doing. Mm-hmm. They're the best in the world. Right. So it's, it's really like kind of getting to know them on a personal level, understanding like, look, sometimes those guys are going in and the only thing they're exercising is demons. And it's like, you're not going to slow that down. Like yeah. they need to just go in and grab a bunch of shit and just go. Right. And a lot of times it'll take some sort of like manifestation of an injury or some sort of like, you know, uh, pain to slow them down to mm-hmm. the point where then you'll have their attention. But in the, in the times between it's like, you just got to understand like, look, what are the battles you can pick? Like what are the gears you can put them into and they're actually going to work rather than just feeling totally like sedated and subdued. So bodybuilders are a, definitely a different breed, but at the end of the day, like they're still people. It's like in order for anyone to make a change, they have to want to make a change. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in being more inclined with that style of training, obviously like being able to kind of hang, you know, m- not maybe exactly pound for pound, but I can be in the conversation with the weights that they lift. That definitely helps with some buy-in. Yeah. Um, but it's no different than if I was working with like a stay-at-home soccer dad. Like I would have to have some sort of, you know, peripheral understanding of Merlot and call of duty. Like I would have to be, I would have to have something to connect with this guy to, for him to want to make a change. Right. So it's, it, it's, it's the same problem that arises in getting anyone to do anything just in a very unique, unique space. Cause like there's, it, you know, their body is their livelihood. There yeah. is an inextricable link. So there's a, there's a level of trust. I think you have to reach with bodybuilders. Uh, before they can actually start listening to what you're saying. Yeah. Because what if, like, what if you say something wrong or they do something wrong and then they get hurt? Like, that inextricable link to their livelihood is something that, that's uniquely bodybuilding. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have this, like, I've heard this phrase that if you work hard but not smart, then you're still lazy. Right? I like that. And I just kind of think, like, there's so many opportunities, even just like working with you and hearing you speak and, and learning from you that there's so many opportunities that they're not, that we're, that we as bodybuilders are not kind of thinking about. We're just kind of throwing shit at the wall and whatever sticks like cool. Is there, is there, are there any things that you kind of see on a day to day basis that you're like, that is not, not make sense. Any exercise that are just like, no, like let's not do this. Um, it's getting better for sure. I'd say a lot of the misinformation, uh, is more on like the female side of aesthetic sport training. Okay. Um, just glute training in general, I think it's like, I'm writing a manual for the level one course and the chapter on the glute max is not even close to done and it's already 4,000 words. And I started <laughs> to realize like, Oh, there's a lot, there's a lot here. Uh, yeah. I mean, just like, you know, we, we talk and you know, this like resistance profiles and strength curves and stuff like that. Um, the, the dumbbell tricep kickback hasn't been in, you know, in rotation for a long time. I don't think, I don't see it done at a very high level anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say the one that gets me in like, I'm not to pick on females, but like the, when they, you, they do a squat, I don't know what it's called, but I'd love to know when they do a squat with a rope and the rope is facing towards the cable. So like their case, they're facing the cable stack and there's a rope pulling them forward. Like oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. And they do it for the glutes. It, that that to me like so here's here's the contrast and i'm actually going into like i literally called to laura and i was like i need you because i you know i'm at pure right and pure muscle yeah. fitness for those of you guys who don't know yeah. is like the epicenter of canadian bodybuilding and you know outside of you know carbon that just opened up i would say mi40 is you know probably up there um gold's venice uh, bevs. bevs muscle works orpington like you, you maybe doherty's there's maybe a dozen gyms in the world that are yeah. similar in concentration like everyone there is looking to get on stage yeah right and i was in there the other day and i saw this 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 girl 
doing this squat thing with like a rope in front of her. And then I saw her later doing like rope pull throughs. And I was like, look, <laughs> at some point, like I called the Laura and I was talking to Mariah. Mariah runs. So like uh, I work with HD muscle and Mariah runs kind of the content there. And that's kind of what I like. I don't talk about like protein powder. I don't yeah. know anything about that kind of stuff. And I was like, look, I'll talk about mechanics and maybe people will buy protein powder. Like if you want yeah. me on and that's what I'll do. And I was like, Mariah, like we have to do like a video on this because it's, if I'm facing a cable machine and the cable is pulling me one way and it's pulling that same direction if I face the opposite way, right? So if I'm doing a rope pull through and I'm doing the squatty butt squeeze thing, yeah. like one of these has to be working kind of well and one of these cannot be possibly be working, working at all. At all. Right? So it's like the rope pull through, it's like, all right, if our glute max extends the hip at the bottom of like the hinge of a, a pull through, my hip is flexed. Mm -hmm. So my glute max could help overcome the resistance or could work against the resistance so that whatever is on the cable stack will actually be stimulating my glutes more, right? If I'm doing a pull through, but if I turn 180 degrees and I do a squatting pattern with the rope pulling me in the opposite direction, the rope is no longer challenging hip extension, right? So Which means the rope is not doing anything. It's a counterbalance. It's making body weight squats easier and you're just squeezing your ass. That's yeah. it. So that's one where I'm just like, because I grabbed, like, it was so glaringly apparent that I grabbed one of the girls that worked there. I grabbed Val and I was like, Val, like, I'm missing something. Like, I, <laughs> I, I'm like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a one level of inception higher than whatever this girl is working at because something has to be. So it's, it's little stuff like that where things are because they always have been. And it's just yeah. like, no, like, hey, stop and think and look like you're doing. The same muscle is it's not a magical muscle it's not like it's not it's not on a gyroscope that when your body turns like oh now it does this other thing totally opposite to the thing we did before it's like what no it's just how does that make any sense so it's like little things like that but it's you know what it's i used to get personally mad and now it's like all right here's an opportunity right like with especially with hd it's like if I can put this out there, you know, just like the tricep kickback has kind of gone uh, away in most of the higher end circles. Um, you know, maybe I can put this out there and people could just use that four to six sets and exercise for something maybe more beneficial. So like the, I, I've shed with like the, the emotional attachment of like, Oh my God, this is so like, I beat your head against the wall. Like, All right, this is an opportunity, right? Thank you. Like, this is this is something that we can disseminate and hopefully we can kind of rid the world of this and just to just so you don't waste any time like that's my i think that's my biggest thing is like you know we have so such like so little time in the gym and just you know in a more metaphysical you know just here in general it's like why when on your deathbed would you want to think ah oh, fuck man i wasted like seven thousand sets of my life doing no <laughs> face it's like <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's definitely like and it's helped like the, the the way i frame those interactions now in a positive has just helped my headspace because you would you just you'd lose your mind you know because yeah. you lose your mind in your own training yeah at a certain point you're just like shut up like shut the up like just shut up shut up and just lift it whatever yeah it's like you know me and you have done enough back end work that it's like the level of minutia of like setting like oh here versus here and put your foot in this it's like okay at a certain point, it only matters when it matters. Right? Yeah. So, and it's not now. So just go. You're going to have to move some shit. That, at the exactly. end of the day, you're going to have to just move some shit. Do you, what, so what would you say then with all your courses behind you and, and everything that – all the courses that you teach, from, for, because it's a bodybuilding podcast, give me – you know, what are maybe like the top five considerations on you know, when somebody's putting together a program or a training day, like – Top five things they can they should be considering, like yeah, through for their workout. So we're we're uh, working out, yeah, whatever. It doesn't even matter body part or whatever. What would you say? So like overarching rules, I think number one would be like your skill level relative to the potential skill required to train the muscle. So that's number one. Now let's dissect that. So what what does that mean? So if we think about training legs the highest skilled movements are probably going to be your squats and your deadlifts, right? Mm -hmm. But your movements versus muscles, what does that mean? It's like, okay, well, like if I'm trying to use a squat to challenge my quads, I need to be able to take 
the muscle of the quadriceps and bring it as close to an inability to contract based off of its metabolic environment as possible. And that will stimulate a response, which will drive muscle hypertrophy over time. If I'm not skillful enough at the movement on the squat and my squat breaks down because of my technique, my, my knee knocks in. It's like if your knee knocks in, it's not going to extend very well. And most of that squat's going to be coming from your adductor attempting to extend the hip. Right? You're trying to create mechanical advantage of your adductor. So that's not a good quad exercise if you don't have the skill for it. So, which is fine. And like, look, most bodybuilders don't. And that's okay because they're not powerlifters. That's not what they're getting tested on. So, you know, maybe understanding that, okay, if the most complex thing on a quad day I could do, the highest level of skill is a squat, but I don't have the squat. What is my top tier movement going to be? Like, well, all right, so maybe we go to, you know, lunges. Maybe we go to leg press, right? Things that aren't going to, uh, to a lesser degree, like the leg press would probably be, if I had to say, hey, we're going to try and challenge the squat or use a squat to challenge the length and range of the glute mat. Okay, you don't squat that well. Maybe you should just do a leg press instead. It's a lot of hip extension, the load, you know, a shorter range of motion, but still relatively similar in the effective part of the range is actually loaded in a squat. Like we don't, the squat doesn't challenge the glute max at the top. It really only challenges in the length and position at the bottom, but you can do that same kind of thing with a leg press and your spine is stable and your knee is less likely to cave in and so on and so forth. Right. So I think that would be number one, like shoulder, like with delts or something like, do you have overhead range of motion? Can you do dumbbell overhead press? Yeah. No. Okay. Then maybe, maybe it's a machine, right. Or maybe it's a high incline or maybe it's a cable lateral or dumbbell lateral. So I think understanding the, you know, the absolute values of complexity of each muscle group and what like your high yield and efficient exercises could be if you had the skill, but then respecting and being honest about yourself of where your skill level is and programming within your skill level, right? Like start with the most complex thing that you can perform and then go more remedial from there, right? Where it's, you know, if that most complex thing is a machine overhead press, then your machine overhead press, you know, rear delt flies, laterals, uh, front raises, cables, whatever, but don't try and you can't, you'll never derive a benefit from a hypertrophy standpoint of attempting to load outside of an active range or load outside of a skill level you, you, don't, you don't yet have. So that's, that would be number one. Second would be understanding your body size and shape, like the anatomical variation. And that will help kind of, you know, when we, when we set filters on the exercises that we choose, it'll help us go like, okay, I want to train like a, like a rope pullover is a pretty, to me, like a, a, a weird thing that people do a lot and doesn't make sense, especially male bodybuilders that are larger across the shoulders. Right. So if I understand my anatomical variations as like kind of the second major thing in organizing a day, like I kind of know that, look, like my shoulders are, are, are decently wide and my lat extends or adducts the shoulder. So if, I, if I'm using a rope and my shoulders are adducted or starting close and going wide, it's like that's not really lats doing lat things, mm-hmm. right? So my anatomical variation in the, in the breadth of my shoulders would dictate that I need these, this handle to be at a point where my shoulders just extend. So maybe I throw some D handles on a mag grip and that sets my grip a little bit wider. You know, maybe I use a couple ropes or I use like a, a prime, uh, a prime tray and I put handles out to the width of my shoulders. Right. So uh, what would be another anatomical variation? Like if I'm doing bicep curls, it's like, okay, I can stand there and just do a bicep curl without respecting what's called like the carrying angle of the elbow and put you know tension through my bicep or my elbow and my shoulder or I can kind of lean off to the side until like that dumbbell just puts a line of resistance right through the bicep and I can do bicep curls there. And then I'm actually putting tension through the muscle of the bicep. So I think anatomical variations would be number two. And there's a lot to that. Like, don't get me wrong. Um, but I'd say that's probably in second order priority to like, you know, your skill and competency of different movements and the exercise selections you'll pick therein. The second to that is like, okay, from an execution standpoint, what are we actually, how do we make this fit what, where my muscles are, right? A third, I would just say, you know, understanding periodization principles is like, you know, the Dorian Yates method works for some people some of the time, right? Like I watch JP lift and I'm just like, what are you, right? Like the progression of just load is something that I think is to the detriment of most bodybuilders just trying to get stronger when your goal is actually trying to get bigger and understanding that, look, these two are not necessarily the same thing. 
right? Mm -hmm. So understanding progressions and periodization will probably be the third most important. Like don't just try and go two and a half pounds a week. Like that linear periodization is not going to directly result to a linear periodization or a linear adaptation in, in building muscle, right? So you know, understand that, hey, maybe we go, maybe we use different variations of exercise selection as a way of programming, right? With, hey, this thing that I'm doing with a dumbbell, maybe I do it with a cable so it's a little less stress. But then maybe I save that, my elbows for, you know, a heavier press later in the week. So really kind of taking this like 306 or 36,000 foot view of your program and starting to see how like, you know, in strength and conditioning, we call it phasic potentiation of like how one day bleeds into the week of training, how a week of training bleeds into a month of training, how that month of training bleeds into like, you know, a quarter or six months or a year of training. Yeah. So I think rather than just going in and just, you know, trying to add two and a half pounds a day, to whatever lift you're doing, I think understanding like from a programming perspective, um, the set or the fourth thing, I can't believe I'm actually, I'm still going. Um, <laughs> there are so, uh, there's so many things that I think yeah. bodybuilders can do, but I think the fourth thing is, is, is having a plan. Like yeah. the one thing that I, I'll, I'll give credence to and almost a contrast to the last method of like, don't just overload weight is at least when guys and girls just overload weight, they actually spend time on the same exercise week in and week out. Right. Like I, I mean, we walk into pure and like, I still do this from time to time. I'm not preparing for anything. I'll go like, Hey, let's try this today. Let's try yeah. this today is the downfall a of idea. many a great bodybuilder. It's just, <laughs> let's try this for the next eight weeks. Yeah. Right. Like let's put together a program based off of like our size and shape, our structure, right. Let's, let's, let's base it off of, um, you know, some of the factors we already talked about. And let's just do these machines for six to eight weeks. We'll improve the relative skill. And we'll, we'll act, sorry, go ahead. So not giving yourself enough time with a specific movement, you're saying? Well, yeah, because people go in like, let's do this today. Like, yeah. wait, what, what, why was, was this randomness? Because bodybuilders, I think, chase novelty rather than specificity. Mm -hmm. It's like, look, you know, if you have a weak point, like, you know, um, like my anterior delts are too small on my front double or something. It's like, okay. Why are we, why are you choosing to do this machine press? That's going to challenge more upper back. Cause you're just, you, you might hit the nail on the head just randomly. Like a blind squirrel can find a nut every now and then. Right. So if you're, you know, if you're missing like, you know, clavicular portion or upper pack and you, you decide like, Oh, let's do this machine today. And this machine is really not lined up in a way where the profile matches the strength curve matches your sort of matches your anatomy. And you're just arbitrarily doing stuff. It's like, well, you can't expect predictable results, right? Like, ah, oh, you know, my upper chest really didn't come up for this next show. It's like, well, yeah, because you walked in every day and it was a different workout. Yeah. Right? So I think that, especially at, you know, gyms that are well outfitted, it can be enticing to be like, oh, like this just came in. Let's use this machine. It's like, let's use it if it's worth doing for 12 weeks in a row. Um, so I'd say that's like number four bodybuilders biggest I downfall. I think that comes from people just thinking that you always, you have that phrase of like, oh, we're trying to trick the muscle. You know, we're trying to, we're trying to tr trick the muscle. We're trying to play some type of game on it that I'm not too sure um, if it's trick or treat, hide and go seek or whatever. But I think that's what that comes from of like, you know, like I, I'm, I'm going to do something different because I don't want to, you know, I don't want, I want to have the muscle adapt to a new stimulus. Um, but you're saying, I guess what your, your point, to your point that that you need to allow it some time to adapt to that stimulus. Yeah. I mean, you have to learn, right? Like if you think about like adaptation through evolution, it's like the fence just didn't wake up one day with like a new beak and just go, <laughs> what the fuck is going on here, man? Like, Jesus. So someone called Darwin, like I, this is a whole thing. Like what's, I can't, it was an, like, it was an adaptation made over generations. It's like, I don't know, yeah. different food source. The, the seed the bird eats is wedged between raw. Or I don't fucking, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Why. It's been a while since I've read Origin of the Species. But it's like, you know, that it's, it's so naive to think that you're, you're so accelerated in your ability to adapt that like two weeks of an exercise, do you give it 168 hours in a week? You, mm. If you do the same exercise like twice a week, you're maybe spending like total time lifting four minutes maybe yeah. less likely less like four minutes and your body is just like wolverine and just adamantium is just like <laughs> it's like oh i can't it's just it's like no it's so silly like it, it takes 
I mean, I know people that have done the same thing for, and, you know, at a certain degree, it does become potentially detrimental, but like, you know, years yeah. and just they, they hammer away and they manipulate, you know, they, they, they use accommodating resistance or they use increased rest periods or they use interset variability. Like, yeah, if you want to go like, Hey, I'm going to do four weeks of drop sets, to increase volume. And I'm going to do four weeks of cluster sets, to increase strength. Fuck. Yeah. That's eight weeks. You get to do something a little different every week. So maybe we drop set the first first or the first week we drop set the fourth set by 40% for an AMRAP. Great. Yeah. How'd you go? Beat the, beat the AMRAP next week. Week three, I want you to do third and fourth set drop set AMRAP. Week four, I want you to beat those AMRAP. Week five, we're going to do, we're going to up the weight by like, I don't know, two and a half percent, five percent. And we're going to do cluster set. Right, we cluster set to a volume of this five percent increase. All right, beat it next week. Give a give yourself a rep range. Go, you're doing eight. You did eight reps total last week of that cluster, and you did it across three like I don't know, uh, three three two. All right, so you did three reps, fifteen seconds, three reps, fifteen seconds, yeah, two reps done. Like beat it. Now your rep range is eight to ten. Right now you got a cluster and get an eight to ten. It's like now you need to go back to your first first week's rep scheme at a heavier weight, five pounds heavier. And it's eight weeks of program. You're doing the same move and you're yeah. getting better and you're getting bigger. And all we did was just manipulate a few variables. Like yeah. we build a base of capacity with volume increasing and we use that volume to help increase strength. And just that little switch of like, I'm doing drop sets now and doing, doing cluster sets. It's just like, it's all it takes. And your muscle is going to be just so like, where the fuck did I go? It's going to be so confused. It's going to be that, your muscle confusion. That's it. <laughs> it's, you know, it shouts out Joe Weider though. Like Joe Weider was one of the real ones, but you know, it's, 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 it's like the squat rope pulley assistant counterbalance, butt flex. It's just yeah. like, it is because it always has been. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to do, I'm going to do this little game with you where I'm just going to name some body parts. And you okay. kind of just tell me what you see, like when I when I when I uh, when I give you this body part. Okay, now, what, when you say what I see, what do you mean? Like, like what, what are you what are you seeing the the cause of that weak body part, or why it's not growing, why it's not changing, um, why it's not being effective? Is that 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 right. sound cool? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, down for it, down for the cause. Okay, so uh, bodybuilder weak glutes, like glutes not developing, they're not getting, you know, they're not getting the. Um, you know, they're, they're not building bigger glutes. They're not getting stronger. What do you see? What are potential issues you see that be, okay, could be the cause of that? Right. So from an internal stability standpoint, they cannot maintain a posterior tilt in their pelvis. Uh, a lot of times this could stem from an unstable core. So they, they ha- their core has an inability to anti-extend. But frankly, someone who has weak glutes probably can't hold a plank for very long in a posterior pelvic tilt. We get tripped up with this idea that the psoas is a hip flexor. The psoas major does more to posteriorly tilt the pelvis. And then in that posterior tilt of the pelvis, that's where we can actually train our glute max the best. When we anteriorly tilt the pelvis, we start to recruit hamstrings and adductors to create hip extension. So uh, an underdeveloped glute max is usually a calling card of an inability to maintain the position of the pelvis that would allow us to move through hip extension using the glute max rather than the hamstring or adductor magnet. So that's kind of be the first one. So if you have an inability to grow your glutes, I would make sure that first and foremost, you have the capacity to maintain the position, i.e. work on your anti-extension through the sagittal play. Do planks, do ab wheels, do reverse GHR setup. Now, once you've done that, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to revert to using that position to execute exercises correctly. If you're trying to squat and you have weak glutes, you should probably fix your core first and then while you're doing that at the same time, do your leg presses instead of your squat. Right? And don't go super high stance. I think people, and that's another mistake people do, they go super high stance and leg press and thinking that the higher they go, the more hip extension they're going to get, the more glute dominant it's going to be. And it's like, it's really just a, like one standard deviation away from the center of your stance towards glute hip dominant and one standard deviation lower than your stance for quad dominant. And it's not like your heels are off the edge for quad dominant and your toes are off the edge for uh, hamstring dominant. So I would say a lot of times it then becomes down to exercise selection and execution of the movement, right? So if you're in a position now where your glutes aren't growing, squats are likely not going to help grow your glutes. Because if up till now you've been squatting, you're likely reaching technical failure, losing position of the pelvis, your knees are drawing in, your adductors and hamstrings are, are doing most of the work. So fix your core, do your planks, progress your planks to different anti-extension exercises. Use that 
that that connection, that position while you're doing your leg presses and then transfer into when you're ready, you know, maybe a squatting pattern down the road. Unilateral movement, step ups, walking lunges um, with a bias towards hip flexion extension uh, and then, you know, plain specific movements, you know, understanding the fully lengthened, fully shortened and mid range. We get the greatest benefit from hypertrophy, from a hypertrophy standpoint, from exercise, uh, like an exercise effectiveness standpoint, rather from training length and positions of muscle. So your leg press is going to be a staple because that's going to challenge the length and position in the glute. All right. So not neglecting mid range, which would be, you know, something akin to like a deadlift, maybe like a mid thigh deadlift, not a rack pull per se, yeah. but more a conventional deadlift. Um, you know, get away from sumos, right? A lot of people get, get away from sumo deadlifts, get away from deficit deadlifts. I would say if you want to grow your glutes and you, you did core work, uh, through anti-flexion extension, like if you did planks three or four times a week or some sort of uh, progression of that movement that trains you to pull your tailbone underneath, keep your pelvis in a posterior tilt, do you use that awareness when training the leg press? Do you use that leg press as the fully lengthened challenge of your glute? And you maybe hit a mid-range, some sort of hinge movement, um, you know, could be like even like a banded dumbbell RDL variation. You hit a fully shortened position of like maybe a 45 degree low back extension or even like a classic uh, glute bridge. You got away from, you know, the staple movements of front facing forward squatty rope cable counterbalance butt squeeze. <laughs> and you got away from the sumo deadlifts. You got away from the deficit deadlifts. You got away from, you know, if large in part to most people like the barbell hip thrust. And move towards those exercises with that intent of maintaining and, and fixing that posterior, that anterior pelvic tilt by creating posterior pelvic tilt. I would say you're going to be in a much better position, just given like the what I see commonly. Yeah. Okay. Um, again, so this just we know that there's going to be some anatomical variations to you know kind of how people's bodies are built and and set up and whatnot insertion to or origin to insertion but what would you say a common another common one for uh, bodybuilding is um legs like they can't build up a leg sweep so more specifically not just leg but leg sweep the outside the the more lateral side of your leg what would you do for that or what do you see the most common reasons why that's underdeveloped in a bodybuilder yeah so the the problem is they don't travel through enough knee flexion extension because how do you, what's the, what's the nomenclature sweep is close right we go close stance yeah. to the sweep yeah and it's like it makes sense if you don't think about it right yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> but here's what's gonna happen right like what's gonna happen if I go on a close stance leg press is if I I need to look at the angle in which or the the the, the distance between my calf and my hamstring. Right. If that angle is still quite obtuse, I'm not going to be training any extensors of the knee. Right. Especially my strongest one, which is the lateralis. So most bodybuilders don't have the range of motion to utilize a close stance squat or leg press for the sweep. What like you can go a wider stance squat. And if your wider stance squat allows your calf to get closer to your hamstring, you're going to challenge more global knee extension which by proxy is going to grow the strongest extender of the knee, which is your lateralis, right? Like no one does like a full ass to grass squat and just has like a VMO and that's it, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to, your body uses the best, like the strongest tool for the job and your strongest tool of ex knee extension is going to be the lateralis. I literally had this conversation with someone in the gym yesterday and it's, it's just, you know, you watch him squat and he goes like closer grip for their closer stance for the sweep but he doesn't even break 90 degrees in his squat. It's like, yeah. dude, you're not, you're going through equal movement, hip flexion, extension, and knee flexion, extension. Like how could this be disproportionately one particular muscle group when the joint action that that muscle group performs is not even being eccentrically loaded to half its potential. Right. So I would say the biggest thing with just growing quads in general and the lateralis will obviously be a huge component of that as it's the strongest extender of our knee is going to be like just get your knee into a flex position so when you're going to put a large demand on the muscles that extend it right so i think this idea of close stance usually minimizes people to about 90 degrees because at 90 degrees on a leg press my my knees are in my chest right if i go wider i can rotate my hips more i can clear my torso and i can get my calf closer to my hamstring 
which means I'm going to have to use more musculature to extend that knee and, you know, and, and to move out of that range of motion. So uh, that's, again, it's one of those things we do it because we've always done it. Right. Uh, we go close stance for the sweep because you know, if someone did that, it's the squat, the squat is, you know, it could be a good exercise skill will also come into consideration. Like if you're, if you're not a good squatter, you're not going to have good leg. Yeah. Right? If you don't have the stability at the lateral hip to keep the sort of the femur in line or the hip in line with the knee, as you extend, uh, extend the knee, then obviously it's not going to be a good exercise. Uh, but you know, even on the leg press, the closer stance usually limits people's ability to actually grow their lateralis much to the, um, you know, much to the contrast of the regular thought process or like the bodybuilding thought process of closer build to the sweep. Yeah. Okay. Let's, um, this is, we're going to throw out probably the most common one, um, calves. So have you, I don't know, have you ever seen those memes of like, you know, if choose, choose the, the yellow pill means you never have to diet again. The green pill means yeah. like, you know, you, you have, you know, wicked shoulders. And then the red pill means like you, you, you never have to train calves or you have the biggest calves ever or whatever. I mean, it's, so, it's, it's so common that calves, like people have this debate all the time that, you know, I can't build my calves or they're such a stubborn body part or, you know, nothing works or it's just genetics. So I'm really, I'm curious. I think a lot of people are going to be interested in this one. What, like what, when you see shitty calves, you know, those just toothpicks hanging out the bottom of, you know, shorts, what are you seeing and the, to the person that actually trains them too? Like, what are you seeing? Um, yeah, that's, that's a tough one. Cause I, I, it's a, it's hard to say that the person actually trains them. And they have shitty calves. I would say understanding the relative knee positions. And most people are after the gastroc, right? Like big fuck off diamond cut gastrocs that just, that your hamstrings hang down. And then you just got this, this ham hawk coming off the upper part of the lower posterior leg. So I would say one of the biggest issues with training the gastroc that I see is not understanding that it's a, a biarticulate muscle. So it, it acts at two joints. It acts at the knee and acts at the, at the, at the ankle. So a lot of people, when they do a calf raise, they keep their knee hyperextended. Right? So if I'm doing a standing calf raise and I keep my knee hyperextended or just straight as I come up on the balls of my foot, I'm not necessarily going to be getting the full potential out of that exercise, right? I'm not going to be getting the full potential out of, you know, that fully shortened position of the gastroc because my knee is not flexed, right? So think of, you know how, you know how MJ used to come up on his toes? Yeah. He did those dance moves? and his shin was forward, you, that's what you got to think. You literally got to think about putting on your white gloves, right? And just like 100%. the Billy Jean jacket and going out there. And like when you go up on your toes, the knees have to translate forward, keeping the tibia forward rather than your knees staying locked. So from an execution standpoint, that's one I see a lot. Stability at the knee could be something to a potential detriment. Like if you have, you know, like ACL and meniscus injuries, like your gastroc, as it acts at the knee is going to like, down regulate its output because the joint in which it acts is unstable. Right. So, you know, hamstrings and calves work together to flex the knee. So if you can create more stability at the knee, maybe it's like unilateral work at the, at the hip. Like, you know, most people have shitty calves can't do a single leg RDL. Right. Mm -hmm. So that, that could be another potential of like, look, if that femur can't stay stable over the tibia muscles that cross, the femur and tibia are not going to be really stoked about exerting a, like their maximum potential, their force. So it's a bit of like a workaround, but it does play a huge role. Like if you have a gastroc, a calf muscle that crosses from bottom to top, attaching onto a femur, and this femur is just sort of like kind of shaking around in infinite space as you go through these movements, like this is going to, this is going to cause an output issue. Right. So that's why, I really like body masters like back in the day used to make this one where it actually like has like a support, like a uh -huh. pad that presses up against your quad. Yeah. That I think is one of the best calf machines because it mitigates that need for internal stability at the femur coming from the lateral hip. Mm -hmm. um, so just a standing calf raise, it's just like, dude, it's like walking out a really heavy squat. Like your body's under this compressive force and any instability through the hip is going to downregulate, you know, any, any peripheral contraction uh, past that hip. So that'd be something that, you know, when we're trying to train the gastrox as like the primary muscle of the, of the calf, I would look to 
you know, maybe beforehand, before you do your standing calf raises, like and execute them properly, driving the knee forward to find the short position, I would say like, you know, maybe do a couple single leg RDLs. Right. And maybe worry about like, you know, don't be in this rib cage flared position. Keep your rib cage over your pelvis. Right. So you, all of that force, there's no force leaking out. It's all like your body feels like, look, I can give a hundred percent of me going through plantar flex and dorsal flexion. And I don't need to worry about the potential consequence of my lumbar spine or, you know, my, 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 my hip joint. And all of these things can just funnel that force right into the calf. Because again, like all we need to do is create uh, uh, like a metabolic environment that was cl is close enough to the glass ceiling of you know what that muscle is able to handle, like if physiologically. And a lot of times, you know, we we run into these neurological bottlenecks of like you know my femur doesn't want my calf that attaches onto that femur to be you know really dropping the hammer. We don't have the traction to really run that nine five quarter mile, right? So right. we, we we pull up and we, we can't, our, our body just governs the engine. So we can't drop the hammer. So we can, you know, we can say that we train calves hard and all that, but it's like hard isn't a stimulus. You know what I mean? Like you, we can't quantify our body doesn't know what hard is. It only knows like a, a, a potential and a threshold close to that, that potential. So that's, that's the tricky one with calves is that there, there are, because it's so peripheral, there's a lot of things that could go wrong prior to that force getting to the calf that could limit you know, the proximity to that failure point that we're, we need to be after to actually drive hypertrophy. Okay. A lot of helpful information there. Um, okay. Last one. So mm, let's go with medial delt. So, I mean, getting that nice round cap delt again, and another big um, characteristic uh, or important characteristic of a bodybuilder creating that physique and creating that V taper. You want to be really wide across the shoulders. Um, and some people just have are really limited to the potential of, you know, just building that calf or have been limited to the potential or not calf, sorry, the, um, the delt. When you see, you know, a flat delt, what are you seeing? What are, where else do you look? Yeah. Uh, that's a tough one. Uh, even from the inside out, this gets into like some mechanics around rib cage compression and expansion. Um, so how people breathe when they perform the exercise and how people sort of just breathe in general, like this idea of like static posture, it gets passed around a lot, but as long as we're still alive, nothing is not moving, right? Like there's no such thing as static posture. So if the delt kind of encompasses from the clavicle to around the AC joint to the, the lateral two thirds of the spine of the scapula, is really just kind of encompasses our, our lateral shoulder. So our rear, our medial delt attaches is kind of right onto what's called like the acromion process, which is more of an extension of the scapula. So what the scapula does or doesn't do is going to have a huge role in our ability to actually lever our humerus off the scapula to go, go through lengthening and shortening of the delt. Um, I would say one of the issues I see is, you know, challenging the movement of abduction of the shoulder rather than challenging the muscle of the lateral delt. Right. So, you know, using too much inertia in that stretch position where in that in that starting position of a lateral raise where my supraspinatus is going to be a little bit more active and I'm carrying momentum through to a top part of the range where my trap is going to be more active. So that's that'll be one exercise selection will be two. you know, understanding how to manipulate force through a strength term. Right. Like how we challenge a fully lengthened, shortened and mid range position is. The lateral delt or the dumbbell lateral raise rather is not mechanically a great exercise for creating like what we'll call like optimal. I don't necessarily like the word, but like optimal tension through the delt as it gets quote unquote, it applies more force in positions where we can exert less force. Right. Um, it comes down to stability of the shoulder. Again, like stability is always kind of my default, whether it's internal or external. So internally we need to think about, you know, the breath, pushing the rib cage out into the scapula, right? That's going to be something we need to take into consideration. It's like how expansive can we be with our breath that our entire shoulder blade in which this delt sort of originates from can feel stable so we can sort of gain that traction to really drop the hammer and, and manifest the benefit of the horsepower or the strength that we have, right? So that's one aspect of it. The second is understanding like the dynamic stability of the major muscles that move the, the scapula. And right? so if I'm doing a lateral raise, I'm going to want to go through a certain level of upward rotation of my scap, right? So involving my serratus anterior and upper trap into the movement rather than trying to 
shut it down, right? People get afraid of the upper trap, like, oh, you're so trap dominant. It's like, you're probably pretty weak in your traps. Like the same people who say like, oh, like oh, my traps are so tight are the same people that got to take two runs in from their car after they get to the grocery store. The motherfuckers <laughs> can't, they can't handle it. You get one shot, you get one opportunity, man. Like, it, Right? So like a tight trap isn't a strong trap. And yeah. the trap is going to work with the serratus to go through upward rotation of the scap, which is going to create dynamic stability of that shoulder as we move. Right. So people try and isolate the delt by not moving the, the scapula. It's just like, dude, the, the trap is massive, right? The trap's got you like the trap. Huge. Can't, yeah. Right. And it's, so I think people try and like, Oh, like I'm trying to isolate my lateral delt and the, you know, my traps are too big. It's like, no one's ever goes, you know what that bodybuilder's issue is? His traps are too big. It's like, what are you, Marcus Rule, Johnny Jackson? Like, get the fuck out of here. Like, that's not a thing. Right? Just and crazy. ironically, both of them have huge delts. Massive. And who could have thought, right? Like, you're proofs in the fucking pudding, man. So I think that's another thing, too, is like, you know, understanding the idea of dynamic stability of the shoulder blade. Right? So, you know, we can use our breath to create stability of the shoulder blade. We can use our serratus and trap as we go through the lateral rays to create stability at the shoulder blade. Because all of that's going to allow us to do is to create more output of the muscle, to bring that muscle closer to the threshold required of it to adapt or rather to provide a stimulus for it to adapt to. Right. Like if you if your traps, if you're shutting your traps down and your scapula deems itself unstable, it's going to be like, hey, all right, Delta can't work anymore. Delt can't, you can't fire a cannon from a canoe, right? So if your delt is not being, or if your scapula is not being supported by your trap and serratus as you go through that arc of abduction, your, your body's going to downregulate the ability for your delt to work against that resistance, which is going to limit its potential to reach that threshold to stimulate the muscle to drive the adaptation we're after. So those are some big ones that I think that people miss, like exercise selection, maybe manipulate your arc with cables. Breathing, stabilize your shoulder blade by expanding your upper back before you start your set, right? Understand that, look, your trap is going to help you. Your serratus is going to help you. Put yourself in the neutral scapular plane as you work through it. Don't, you know, pull back in like an upright row mid-trap exercise. And, you know, if you get that stuff right and you hammer away, like that should help mitigate a lot of like the, the stubbornness of that muscle to grow. Awesome. Um. So this is just kind of wrapping up here. Like where, where do people find you? Where do we, like, where, what are you all coming out with any courses now or anything new? Um, what are you offering? Where do people find you? Where do the people get a hold of you? Yeah. I live in, I live in Burlington now. So you guys are in Burlington. I just, I don't know. I'm probably walking around with a coffee in my head somewhere. Uh, yeah, so we're coming up. Well, right now we have the level one that we've been teaching for a handful of years. That's kind of like our flagship course that we teach and kind of going over. So a lot of the principles actually we just discussed. So it must be boring to you to hear this for the 10,000th time. Um, but so the, the pre-trip level one course is kind of our mainstay. We have more specialty courses. Uh, the barbell course, which is based around like the mechanics of squat bench and deadlift, um, both the like a, a exercise execution, like her heuristics program, as long as like the actual programming side of it so that's a six-week course we spend two weeks on each lift um both in lecture and then plus we have tutorial uh you know course content that goes along with it so the whole, whole course works out to be something like 30 hours just on on three lifts and that's progressions regressions adaptations optimization so that's the barbell course the weightlifting course uh will be out in january and that'll be fully automated uh that's a six-week course uh, we have one for our more sport coach inclined that's uh, taught by Killian Hamilton. That's going to be out in January. I want to say it's the 14th of January. That's the skill acquisition course. The level two for current pre-trip level one coaches is going to be live in March. We are 12 weeks into the current level one with registrations now live for the November, which I believe starts November 24th. So the next 16 week pre-trip level one course will be then. And then we're hopefully looking at some in-person dates uh, for the level one uh, in 2021 in Nottingham, Dubai, and then in Toronto uh, out of Pure Muscle and Fitness. So you know, if anyone's interested, uh, prescript.com, P-R-E-S-C-R-I-P-T.com, or just my Instagram at the underscore muscle underscore talk. If you shoot me a message, I can get you any info that you need. Will you be teaching the Turkish getup at any 
during any of those courses. That's going to be a big no for me, dog. <laughs> All right, Jordan. Thanks so much for joining us on Buried Under the Bar, man. Really appreciate you. Um, go follow this guy. Uh, just a bag of knowledge. Just too much. I, I, I can't even say how much um, I've learned from you. And uh, so really appreciate you coming on the show today, man. Um, we'll talk and uh, take care. Yeah, man. Appreciate you taking the time, dude. It's good to see you. All right, man. Take care. Yeah.